Welcome to Art Nature Science on the Binnaburra Cultural Landscape, the podcast that tells the story of the mountain's natural wonder through art making and exploring the creative spirit and celebrates the history and heritage of this magnificent World Heritage Area. My name's Michelle Walker and I'm joined today by Glenn Cook. Glenn was the curator of Queensland Art Gallery for 32 years, first as the curator of decorative arts and then the Queensland Art Heritage. Glenn continues to research visual art heritage for the benefit of the artist's memory, and I would suggest for the benefit of us all. Hello, Glenn. Welcome. Good morning, Michelle. I would love it if you could share briefly about the research work that you've been doing into the history of Vidalet's work. What I've been doing at the moment is actually I've almost completed a database of Vida's exhibition history. It's a lot of work, but it's actually based on the surviving exhibition catalogues. If you think about it, if you come across a painting by Vidalet and it has a name on it and you want to find out about it, where do you start? If you're lucky, you have access to an archive and like at an art gallery and then can actually hunt it up. And if you're lucky, you've got access to the right catalogue. But for most people... Uh, there'll be very little chance of doing that. So I've done this as a start to further research on, on Vidalet's work because you'll be able to connect with the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art Research Library and access the database. And so if you know the title of the work, you've got a pretty good chance of finding out a little bit about it. Fantastic. As you know, Vida Lay's work and her artistry is of particular significance to Binnaburra on a couple of fronts, and her legacy of her artwork obviously sits underneath the Artists in Residence program, and we're currently in this Art Nature Science program for Binnaburra. What role did she play in the Queensland art world during the 20th century? Because that seems like how she's risen to great acclaim. I'd love to hear a bit more about that from you. Well, for an artist, I'm sure she would regard her artwork as her major claim, but certainly she was intensely involved in the Queensland art scene. She was actually a member of the Queensland Art Society and with her friend and sculptor Daphne Mayer, they established the Queensland Art Fund, which managed to get the Selina Rivers Trust established in which they worked through there. And also they acquired uh, the matching fund, which was one of the conditions of the Darnell Art Fund. And so that brought together a core of work for the Queensland Art Gallery collection. But more broadly, she and uh, Daphne Mayo access the Carnegie Corporation to get funds to establish the Queensland Art Library, which brought a large range of publications and photographs of contemporary artworks to Brisbane, which were not accessible elsewhere. And on top of that, you also have her influence in child art classes, which she'd done under the aegis of the Queensland Art Gallery for many years. So her contribution, quite apart from her artwork is actually enormous. It is, isn't it? So broad. And her initiatives with Daphne really had a positive influence on so many other people. And the, the collection of those resources as a library for people into the future, I think, is a fantastic initiative. Yeah. Coming back to her artwork, you said to me that you can see some of the connection that she had with Binnaburra through her brother Romeo did come through some of her artwork. Can you tell us a bit more about that from your research? Well, I have to say from the outset that Vida was known as a flower painter and specifically regarded highly for the strong influence that colour had on her career. But also she was a watercolourist and also a landscape painter. So indeed, no, landscape was a large part of her output and particularly like sites like in Mount Tambourine and uh, Canungra, but also, no, specifically in relation to Binnaburra, from, from about the mid-40s, paintings with specific title of Binnaburra appeared in her work, and also on top of that, I'm sure there are 
subjects called mountain flowers, which were, were would have been produced at Benabarra. When we have generalised titles, we're really not sure they were, but basically Binabara would have been part of her inspiration, no doubt. Mm. And she did a work called Art and Nature, which I love, which is a still life of a floral arrangement. And I think that she was obviously very connected to nature through the florals and the landscapes. And so it does make sense that Binabara and Lamington generally would have been a great source of inspiration. And she obviously as I've read, uh, was incredibly supportive of Romeo's conservation work and his mm. tireless campaigning for that area. So that, Indeed. It was uh, it, it's also important that Art of Nature, the uh, bas-relief paint, which is in the painting, is actually was produced by Daphne Mayo. So it actually makes a very ah. clear link between Daphne and, and Vida as well. Yeah. You were telling me that she was largely unknown for her works or perhaps not as well known as she was painting through most of her years until much later. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, Fyder and Kenneth McQueen were probably the two Queensland-based artists who had the largest profile in the southern states because Vida did exhibit quite extensively in Sydney and Melbourne and even on occasions in Tasmania where she did spend a couple of years of her life. But her work in those cases was largely flower paintings and it was as a flower painting that she was appreciated. And certainly during this period, a flower painting was an important genre and she was very much appreciated by Sir Arthur Streeton, mm -hmm. who was a flower painter of uncertain note himself. And the thing he found most important about her was her use of colour. I think the expression was, there are few people who could actually match her colour sense. Colour painting was her concession to modernism. She mm -hmm. wasn't a particularly radical artist, but she did bring the, a, a blessing of colour to her work. Paintings by her were acquired by the National Gallery of Victoria at the time and also in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Mm. But the painting of which she is known is Monday Morning, which is actually quite an anomaly in her work. I believe it was inspired through the efforts of Gwendolyn Grant, who was a, a student from, from Brisbane, who did complete her degree course at the National Gallery School. And when she returned to live in Brisbane, she actually shared a studio with Vida. And I believe she was the inspiration that had by to produce a large-scale figurative painting, which is one of the final exercises that an art student did at the National Gallery School for the Travelling Arts Scholarship. Vida never completed the degree course, but when it was exhibited, it was immediately appealing to the public. It was an exceptional work even then. It was purchased by Madame Angley Congo, our local poet, and presented to the gallery through the Queensland Art Gallery Society and then had a very quiet life in Brisbane because it was an unknown outside the state until Janine Burke put together her first publication on Australian women artists and chose her work for the front cover because paintings of women doing sort of basic house cleaning work was quite exceptional at the time. And it was from that occasion that it has become her most recognised work. But mm. no, her reputation during her lifetime was built on her flower paintings and landscapes. So it is one of the surprises, quirks of art history, that an anomalous painting becomes her key painting. And that figurative work that you've been describing, if people haven't seen it, it's the image of two women bent over laundry tubs, mm -hmm. washing and, clothes and, in coppers, isn't it? That's right. And the f full of steam as the woman's role on Monday used to be in the olden days. And I think one of the things that struck me, apart from recognising the work and not realising it, recognising it as hers, was seeing all the colours that she incorporated into the clothing in the, the tubs was mm. A reminiscent of the incredible colours she used in her flowers. So yeah. I, it was delightful to see that. And it's great to hear from you that history of how 
that work got elevated through perhaps a bit of an a bit of an anomaly in her art practice, but became one of her more recognised works. Yes, yeah. But as I said, the, the, her flower paintings are really quite remarkable, all the same. But again, a, apart from Margaret Preston, most of the people who who painted flowers studied during the post-war period in the 20s and 30s have been largely sort of dropped out of history. But obviously now there is actually a big effort to reclaim the significance of their works. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what you're doing, which we're so grateful for in giving life and putting some of this information into a way that we can access it. Was there anything else that you discovered along the way with your research? Any other unexpected elements of Vida's life or artistry that you want to mention? Her life deserves all mention because, no, she was a dedicated artist. And being a dedicated artist in Queensland was required exceptional effort. I understand. You know, well, she actually started off her career with you no know, doing things like carving chairs and sort of d designing for uh, copper mirrors, as a lot of that ladies did at the time. But then she shifted pretty well exclusively to painting work. And even in that limited field, she actually gave up several years of her life and worked with Daphne Mayo and set up the Queensland Art Fund and promoted that. No, that was actually a remarkable effort for both these ladies. They put their careers on hold to, for the better good and for the better good of the people of Queensland. Mm, fantastic. Well, it's just been delightful chatting to you today. Glenn, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Doing a database is actually a first step towards a catalog raisonade, but that's a very long, long way away, I believe. So it'll be up for someone else to do it. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing what comes out of your endeavours and really appreciate you joining us on the podcast to talk about Vita Lay's artistry. Thanks so much, Len. My pleasure, Michelle. The producers and artists on this podcast acknowledge the traditional owners of the Binnaburra area in Lamington National Park, the Yugambeh Language Group. We also thank Catherine Slingsby for the podcast theme music, an excerpt from her piece, Sweet Dream. <laughs>